Well, we kick off our investigation with our first white shocker, which occurs after 1 e4 e5. Now, it's well known at any level of chess that when you open 1 e4, two replies more than any other are going to be critical to the formation of a successful repertoire for you. The first is, what shall I do in the open game after 1 e4 e5? And the second one is, what shall I do against a Sicilian? It's no secret that at the highest level of chess, grandmaster level, these two moves, 1 e5 and 1 c5, are by far the most common. And the reason is pretty clear. They dissuade white from actively occupying the centre with an early d4. There are many defences for black against 1 e4, but no other move moves apart from e5 and c5 actively stop or dissuade white from playing this, this natural move. Now e5, well that's the move we start off with in our chess careers. It's perhaps a move we move away from as we get stronger. And um, at the grandmaster level, certainly an idea which a lot of players come back to because they recognise that this is the move for black if he wants to keep it solid. To deny white a lot of attacking opportunities and to give himself chances for a win without having to take too many risks. I think this is why a lot of players like e5. c5, well that promotes an asymmetric position. It's much sharper than um, e5. It gives white... Lots of opportunities to attack, certainly in the open Sicilian. There you have to really know your stuff. But at Grandmaster level, this is obviously an exceptionally common move as well because their technique is very high, def def defensive technique especially, and they feel they can weather the storm, basically, when they play C5 and go on to counter-attack thereafter. So with White, you know, you have to have something against E5 and C5. Well, now, against E5 allow me to recommend the delayed exchange variation of the Ryle Lopez. An idea known since the 19th century, since Steinitz, and I think and a very effective idea, something which will give your opponents pause for thought at club level, let's say, because basically they're never going to have to, they're never going to have ever played against this move, in my opinion. And the move occurs after bishop a4, knight f6, and now white takes on c6. So what are the differences between this position and let's say the normal exchange variation where white takes on c6 or move 4 and then usually castles. Well now back to our mainline position after bishop takes c6. Well the first thing I notice is the development of black's knight to f6. You wouldn't think this makes too much of a difference but actually the development of that knight to f6 takes a lot of the sting out of black's counterplay in this variation. Firstly and foremostly the knight blocks the f-pawn. You often see black launching the f-pawn forward in the uh, exchange variation itself and this will be a move which facilitates active counterplay. Furthermore, in the exchange variation direct, uh, black often plays his knight to e7. And this is a very flexible square for the knight. Um, the knight can often swing across to g6 and in the exchange variation itself, g6 is quite a good square for the knight. The knight can often then hop into f4 or maybe into h4, either of which uh, will give black attacking opportunities on the king side. With knight f6, with the knight already on f6, it, uh, you know, black hasn't got the same options at his disposal. So I think what I'm saying is position's a lot less dynamic once that knight has been developed to f6. Now let's take play on a little bit further to d takes c6, and now pawn up to d3, our recommended move. The second big difference to this in this position is of course that white hasn't castled and this makes all the difference as far as I'm concerned. White's position here is rock solid, his development is very coherent and he often plays to mass an attack either in the centre or more likely on the king side in true Steinitz style uh, before actually deciding where to commit his king. The very solidity of white's position and the fact that black's counterplay takes actually a lot longer to, to come into focus in this variation because of that development of the knight on f6 means that white can actually linger around with the king in the middle for quite some time and uh, build up a kingside attack. And an unsuspecting opponent could often stumble into a bad position. For instance, if black castles early in this line, he can often find himself face, facing a withering assault from uh, white's pieces. Which actually brings me Conveniently, conveniently to my first example game and it's between Grandmasters Eduard Gufeld playing with um, the white pieces and none other than Grandmaster Mikhail Tau. This is an old game, it was played back in the 1950s but it's very, very relevant to our discussion. Now Tau in this game 
plays knight to d7. Basically, black is given a lot of rope um, as to how he wants to develop his pieces. First thing I suppose he's got to solve, the first problem is, how, where do I put my bishops? Well, it's not that easy to to find the right square for black's bishops in this line. Basically, white's plan is as follows. He's going to develop his knight to d2. The knight can often come back to f1, and then the natural Lopez development will be up to g3. That would be one manoeuvre. White can also think about playing h3 and g4 in this line. And once his knight's on g3, perhaps backed up by a pawn on g4, the knight can consider hopping into f5, which would be a beautiful outpost for the knight. White's bishop on c1 can often be developed to e3. Um, the bishop may not move at all in the opening stages as white is going through with this knight manoeuvre. But meanwhile, black's got some problems getting active counterplay together. For instance, a move like bishop g4 in this position has no effect. White just plays h3. You see, at any stage, white can revert to the normal advantages of the exchange Raya Lopez in that he's got a much better pawn structure. You know, there, there are... Uh, there are definite merits in just reverting at some point if white develops naturally and black likewise to the the um, the usual uh, exchange Spanish advantage of the better pawn structure. White is looking to create a pass pawn in the centre and on the king side. He's got a king side pawn majority there, and and gradually um, once he's got rid of this pawn, look to create a pass pawn later on and win in the end game. So white needn't mechanically just go for a king side attack in this line, although it's certainly as you'll see a very dangerous option that Black has to consider. So Tao, being a great player, understands all this. He, he can see that it's going to be difficult to find the right squares for the Black Bishops, so he just drops his knight back to d7, awaiting events. And Gufel plays his knight to d2. Now Black plays bishop e7, and White brings his knight up to c4. So it's not that White is renouncing the idea of kingside attack, very much the opposite, as we're going to see. It's just that he basically wants to force the move f6 out of black when that bishop on e7 is less than impressive. I suppose after f6, white could even consider dropping the knight back to e3 when uh, the f5 square is beckoning. So black decided to play bishop f6. White played his queen to e2. Now at this stage, if I was black, alarm bells would start ringing in my head. What is white up to? You know, because... If we just drop back, castles on the king side would be a natural enough move for white. Once I see the move queen e2, I start to imagine that white may castle on the king's, uh, the queen side in this position and then start launching my pawns, launching his pawns, something like that, h4 and g4. And, um, well, for this reason, Tau delays castling for the time being, preferring to play c5. White brings his bishop out to d2, and now the... The, uh, the game is about to continue. I mean, the drawback of bishop f6, to my mind, is obvious. It's a clumsy move. Uh, you don't really want your bishops observing central pawns at the early stage of the game. I think black should have played f6, but then maybe bishop e7 was an imprecision anyway. Even the great Tal has been cajoled into playing a, <coughs> an, incorrect, an incorrect move at an early stage of the game. You know, black, usually in this line, wants to plant a knight on d4. And uh, one manoeuvre you've got to watch out for, we'll see this in, in a, um, a coming game, is the idea that black might put his knight back on b8, bring it up to c6, and then into the key square d4. White has always got to be aware that this, uh, this possibility exists from black's point of view. So that's something to watch out for. But of course, at the moment, black can't move that knight because his e-pawn would drop. Hence the value of knight c4 is obvious. And again, if we look logically at the position, this is why Gufeld plays bishop d2. Because, you know, maybe he's going to put his bishop on c3 in a minute and pressurise that pawn on e5. So Tau probably thinks, OK, I've got to castle um, and take what's coming to me. Maybe I, I've blundered, but, you know, this is not a lost position. I'm going to play on and uh, let White do his stuff, which, of course, Gufeld does. He goes straight through with the move g4. And uh, Tal is relying on b5 to facilitate counterplay. But the knight comes back to e3, which is the excellent square. Now white's definitely eyeing up uh, those central squares d5 and f5. And black plays g6. Not only to keep the knight out from f5, but to give his bishop a retreat square to g7, should that become necessary. h4. Well, I think in this game we see a, um, a very good example of successful white opening strategy in this line. 
Black's development has yet to be completed. Possibly he's committed his king to g8 a little bit too early. And white has, there's no doubt about it, a vigorous attack. Well, Tau plays knight b8. And, uh, of course, that knight's not going to be on b8 for very long. It's going to come to c6 and into d4, perhaps, at the earliest opportunity. Yet, white can continue to mass his pieces in easy style. And we, we can see the plan of campaign is obvious. He's just going to push his kingside pawns and try to blow black away. And um, this is a straightforward plan, I'm sure, which will appeal to a lot of club players. I mean, firstly, the delayed exchange takes away an enormous amount of learning because there are a lot of blackout options like the main line, Rilo Pez, closed Rilo Pez, the open Rilo Pez, an enormous amount of lines which suddenly you don't have to learn anymore. And the plan of campaign for White is fairly obvious. You manoeuvre, you keep your king in the centre, you, you've got the initial idea of building, building up to a king's side attack, but there are other options as well. You might play to knock out black central pawn with uh, d4 and go for uh, the usual Spanish exchange advantage of the better pawn structure. There are many options available to white in this line. And, um, well, as we can see, Tal is getting into trouble. All right, he plays bishop e6. White pauses for the time being, playing king b1, and black brings his knight into b4. Well, bishop takes b4. Um, not at all an unhappy exchange. Uh, white is happy to cede the bishops because in return, he gains time. He plays g5. Bishop comes back to g7 and knight to g4. So a very uh, strong concentration of force on the king side. f5. Well, this was problematic for poor old Tal. I mean, if he takes the knight, the rook just recaptures a very easy move and then h5 follows very quickly, followed by perhaps rook h4. I mean, it's obvious that white's going to have a fantastic attack. The queen just had to join the party. And uh, once... Once black has exchanged off his light square bishop, she can easily do that via f1 and then up to h3. So there are plenty of easy ways for, for white to build the attack. I mean, you can just imagine having this position in a, in a club game, you know. It, it, it's incredibly difficult to defend these positions with black. Probably the guy with black is going to use up a lot of time, he's going to come under pressure, and when you're launching your final attack, you'll run out of time. I mean, I've seen this sort of thing happen in a position like this time and time again. The guy with the initiative almost always wins in club chess. Because it's so difficult to defend after a long day or maybe when you're tired or whatever. So Tau, and of course this is true for Grandmasters as well, decides to go for it and plays f5. He's not going to be murdered in his bed or die, uh, die passively. He's going to go for it and try and mix things up. So Gufeld takes on f6. Bishop takes g4. Rook takes g4 and now Queen takes f6. So counterplay is enabled... Um, by attacking the knight on f3. But Gufeld has seen all this, and he defends by putting his rook on h3. And this in no way diminishes the chances of white's attack. Because um, another feature of this position, if we talk strategically, is the way that white is positioning his pieces out of range of the black bishop. This is a typical device in a bishop versus knight middle game, um, and a very effective one, because it effectively renders the enemy bishop... Um, worthless. So despite the fact Tal has got some counterplay now on the F file, he's still much worse. Um, and White's attack proceeds on oil wheels after H5. Well, Black's last move might have looked like a counter-attacking gesture, but in reality it was a defensive move. Uh, A5 prepared the transfer of the rook to A6. Gufeld continues stripping away the pawn cover around the Black King. And now he plays his rook back to g2. Uh, as a prelude, I think, to moving the knight. You know, the rook defends um, f2. And now he's thinking about moving his knight to g5. All right, b3. Well, again, this is a move which uh, confirms that white is better uh, to my eye because it's a rather desperate counter-attacking move by black. Um, yes, he gets the chance to gain some purchase on the white pawn structure with a4. But... Now white continues with his idea, uh, initiated by rook g2 by playing knight h4. And uh, black has no time really to, to dwell on the position. He has to continue to, to try to strip away the uh, barriers around the white king and get to grips with um, get to grips with the king because you know his, his own kingside position is basically falling apart.
So rook takes g6. Rook f8-8. A nice move, threatening mate. Gufeld has seen all this. Plays c takes b3. And now queen f7. I mean, actually, well, black can check on a1 in this position, but king c2, and then what comes next? Black's problem here, the g-file. Rook takes g7. Bang. This is an extremely strong move. Obviously, if black takes with the queen, white can go rook g3. So king takes g7. What has Gufeld got to show? It's knight f5 check. All the way to the finish in this game, white seems to be one move ahead of the curve. Tau is getting ready to launch his counterplay with queen takes b3 and then rook a1 mate. But Gufeld is right on the button here with his, with his play. He brings his queen to g4. Rook g6. Knight e7 check. Very strong indeed. Let's not forget that white is actually two pawns up in this position. So normal play for black is now out of the question. Knight takes g6. And queen takes b3. It's basically a rather desperate move. Just going back, well, obviously, black could take that, but then, you know, white has a choice. He could play queen d7 and win by direct attack, or he can win the rook ending after queen takes g6. So queen takes b3, what else? Knight takes e5, check. <coughs> it becomes clear that Gufeld's got it all worked out. King takes e5, <coughs> and the very nice discovered attack to finish off d4. The rook attacks the queen. So, um, black resigned. I consider that a model game uh, for this variation. White outplayed black in the opening, um, and this was not any patzer that was being outplayed. It was the legendary Mikhail Tau, and um, really concocted a, a, a vicious kingside attack uh, in an almost effortless way. So, I think this is a very good way to begin our investigation. I mean, you could almost go out and play the variation just by seeing this one game. I really think it is as simple as that. So things to remember. One, black playing knight f6 takes away a lot of his active tries against exchange variation setups. Point number two, white delays castling in this variation, pre preferring to create the possibility of a kingside attack first. On we go.